You're listening to P-R-O-X. Is the 2023 version of Tunji looking back at that 2010, like first getting the job, first getting the shot, right? Were there ever aspirations to be running a record label at that time? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I just wanted to be Jay-Z. So I wanted to be the best rapper and like the greatest executive at the same time. So <laughs> that was the whole goal. Wow. So to be at Def Jam is interesting. You're listening to In Proximity. Tunji Balagun is CEO and chairman of Def Jam Recordings. Archie Davis is Proximity Media's co-founder and co-head of music alongside Ludwig Gorenson, and he's chief creative officer of Def Jam Recordings. But 15 years before landing in the C-suite, Tunji and Archie met as a young assistant and intern, respectively, at Interscope Records, where they cut their teeth in the music business, working with then up-and-coming artists like Kendrick Lamar and Schoolboy Q. Tunji actually got a start as a rapper before moving into music marketing and A&R, signing artists like Childish Gambino, SZA, and Her. Archie was a leading architect in the Black Panther soundtrack the award-winning Wendy's We Beef in EP, which you should really check out, and the Judas and the Black Messiah soundtrack, an Academy Award-winning original song, Fight For You, by her. On this episode, Tunji and Archie share lessons on navigating careers in the music industry, specifically in marketing and A&R, working on the Wakanda Forever soundtrack and bringing Tunji's Nigerian connections to the project, and what they consider their top five albums that define the human experience. My name is Tunji Balogun. If I was in Nigeria, I would say my name is Tunji Balogun. But, you know, when I'm in America, Tunji Balogun. I'm the CEO and chairman of Def Jam Recordings. I'm Archie Davis, co-founder of Proximity Media, oversee music with Ludwig Gorenson, and chief creative officer of Def Jam Recordings, alongside my creative partner, Tunji Balogun. Yes, sir. Live from Santa Monica, California. Def Jam Recording Studios in the building. It's kind of cool to get to do, like, this is kind of like I'm working, but it feels it doesn't feel like work, and I think that's why we've been able to do this for so long together. Absolutely. So we both got started in A&R, and I know to a lot of people that term may be so gray, and it may be like, that is the coveted job of the music business. Like everybody wants to be an a and whether they admit it or not. <laughs> but a lot of people don't know what an a and is or does. Can you explain the definition and the job? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a term from the 50s that stands for artists and repertoire. It comes from an era where labels would sign artists, really they would sign singers and just kind of pair them with music that they already had that was written by other people that music would be the repertoire. So that job title got shortened to A&R. I would say in this era, it's very different, but a lot of the principal elements of, you know, where the job started remain. It's really about discovering and breaking artists. And I always talk about three stages of A&R. That's discovery, development, and delivery. The discovery is obviously, you know, having ears and knowing how to identify something that feels special and signing bringing something into the company. Development is all the things that you have to do to get the artist to live up to the vision that you have for that artist. So that's, you know, helping them make better music, connecting them with other creatives that can enhance what they're already doing. And then delivery, breaking the artist, actually helping to tell the story, working with the rest of the label, whether that's marketing, publicity, digital, to impart everything that you know about the artist and their vision so that they have the information to go out and find those champions outside of the building that can get behind the artists and give them opportunities to break. Let's talk about 15 years ago. Interscope, Geff, and A&M. Tell us what you were doing. I mean, the way that I snuck into the building was there's a woman named Nikki Benjamin who I'd worked for previously at Warner Brothers Records. I was a marketing assistant under her and another marketing director at Warner. And then she ended up leaving to go to Geffen sometime in, in 2006. I stayed at Warner and, you know, I got laid off from Warner, slept on couches for about eight, nine months. And then I remember it was like the day before Halloween 
in 2007, Nikki called me and she was like, hey, I don't have a job for you. It's not really a job, but I can hire you as a temp. So like, you're not going to get benefits or anything, but you'll get paid and you can work and like, let's get, let's get back in. And I'm like, yes, I'll be there on Monday. I'll be there on Monday. So Hmm. that's how I got into the Geffen Interscope space. For people who don't know, you know, Interscope obviously is a label that was started in the late eighties, I think maybe or early (laughs) nineties, I think early nineties. Yeah. Early nineties. My bad. By Jimmy Iovine, Ted Field and Tom Wally. We worked in the Geffen imprint under Interscope. But it all kind of rolled up to Jimmy Ivey. And we got to witness, I would say, the last five years of his reign by Interscope, which was just sort of like a masterclass, seeing the legendary executive telegraph his vision to the world. You know, we, we, we saw Lady Gaga come in yep. as like, oh, who the hell is that girl from New York? And then six months later, she was the biggest star in the world. Yep. <laughs> you know, we saw Eminem come back. You know, the recovery album, the Soldier relapse Boy. album, saw Soldier Boy blow up. Just, there was a lot. So, like, very much like a front row seat to mid-2000s industry. And um, shout out to Nikki Benjamin because she got me into that into that world. And, yeah, I remember meeting Archie. Archie was in the a r department. I was in the marketing department, which is ironic because we later switched. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we definitely ended up sort of making our names in the vice versa department. But it was it was very amazing to just observe and watch and learn. I was already a massive, massive music fan and, and an expert in my own way because of my fandom. But And your rap ability. Let's oh not let's not let's not <laughs> skip over that. You were you tried it. Oh man. Okay, yeah. That was <laughs> happening too. I was rapping a lot. That that was definitely the era where I was still actively working on my artist stuff. And honestly, that's the cornerstone for everything that ended up happening as far as my A&R career was all the relationships and the knowledge and the instincts that I had from being an artist. You know, knowing how to be in the studio, knowing how to work with producers, knowing how to pair people up to make certain types of songs. All that stuff was definitely the building blocks. Do you think that level of empathy, like as an artist and a creative first kind of helped you? I guess it would, you just kind of nurture your relationships as you would grow with kind of some of the artists in their careers because you've helped quite a few artists from kind of like zero to the 65 to 125 mile per hour place (laughs) time and time again and in a short period of time relatively so 15 years though you know when you look at it but no it's it's all it's all connected right it's all the same kind of muscle or or, you know reflex just because That's the world that I came from. Seeing all these kind of outsiders become stars on their own terms, whether it was Lana or Soulja Boy or Kendrick or Lady Gaga, that was just a masterclass in like, oh, okay, you can actually sign something and identify something that's really, really different, build it up to a place where the whole world appreciates it, but protect the magic and not lose any of the taste level and quality you know you don't have to go quote unquote pop to go pop you know Mm -hmm. you can actually still be a real artist so that became the blueprint for everything that that i did and i'm sure you know it was the same way for you but yeah yeah i mean going back to those days those early days (laughs) you know i feel like it was just like trying to become indispensable to the process in whatever way in our respective roles me in the marketing space you in the a r space it's just like going above and beyond Yep. It's like, I need to keep my spot in this building, so I need to be so nice with, like, booking travel, doing expenses, answering whatever requests are needed for these artists, dealing with managers, you know, and then also, like, when I'm not in the building, when I'm out running around, just really making connections and being a part of that young, creative, hustling scene and community, that all feeds back with good information and opportunities for the artists and the people in the building. So that's what we were trying to do. I feel like we worked on that for, like, three, four years. I'm going to take it a step further, though, because I was there with you at that time, but I also was fortunate enough to be there with you when you kind of like were coming back into the building as the CEO and chairman of Def Jam, right? You named a lot of, a lot of different departments and people, but the people that I saw a lot of excitement from were the security guards that still work at that building, yeah, man. the guys that still park the valet. And it was almost like this, you taking this step and moving 15 years later into this role 
14 years later into this role was a win for them as well. And I think trying to be indispensable is one thing, but I think it's also just treating people with kindness and care and not treating the relationships as transactional, I think went a long way. No, absolutely. And I, you know, I would say that goes back to just coming from a Nigerian family (laughs) and being Hmm. taught to be very much polite and treat people with respect, no matter what position or, or, uh, status quote unquote they they occupy like and you know move with integrity and in a business where people don't expect people to do that <laughs> sadly right. i very much I, like i vowed to myself that i wouldn't compromise my values in this industry and that i wouldn't do anything for money or just to like rush the process yep. I, to- I told myself that at the beginning and somehow that actually worked <laughs> so yeah i mean I don't, I don't think anything any of this would have happened without all of the things that happened at the beginning, um, yep. which were unplanned and for the most part, pretty organic. So from getting into the Interscope building in 08 as a temp, it took me three years to actually get a real permanent full-time job. And I ended up temping in every department, you know, for, whether it was publicity, I did business development for a long time. I was in royalties, like anyone who needed someone who was knowledgeable of the system, which was basically like, how do you book travel and do expenses, which, which, every, ex, which every executive needed, needed someone who had those basic skills. And, you know, once you became like, and answering oh, the phones and answering the phones and, and keeping the schedule, yep. you know, making sure the schedule was on point. But yeah, we became experts at that. It became sort of like second nature, but we were also creatives, man. So we were, we were always like trying to get to a creative job, <laughs> even right. though we were doing the logistical, you know, assistant job. And also trying to contribute creatively with ideas and insight wherever we could. And then as days go by and turn into weeks and months and years, people start to notice and and recognize, oh, okay, this kid actually is contributing in whatever way that is. There was an interesting shift in the music business in general, but like I I was able to have bosses that would trade the responsibility to do more creative things with just making sure that the logistical stuff was handled. And as long as I can handle the logistical stuff and just the scheduling and the basic stuff of the job, that was when more of the creative responsibility started to show themselves. It was like, master this and then I'll give you access yeah. to, to show me your other talents and skills. So that lasted from 2007 to 2010. At that point, I was also doing a lot of like digital stuff on the side because I was an artist and I was a nerdy internet kid. So I was connected in that in the blog world. Mm-hmm. So many of the artists who ended up coming to define the era, this era of rap, exploded out of this blog era during which like the blogs were almost, I would say, similar to like a playlist <laughs> nowadays or getting on Rap Caviar or maybe something something like that. If you could get your music posted. You could really build an audience because that's where the fans, the growing amount of fans online were going to find new music. Artists like Kendrick, Drake, Cole, Cole, Wale, Cuddy, Big Crit, Wiz, Dom Wiz Kennedy, Khalifa, Wiz, Dom Currency, Kennedy, Mac Miller, Schoolboy, Schoolboy Q, Absolute. all the TD stuff, Joey Badass, ASAP, Ferg, and Rocky, like the, the whole ASAP mob, like Odd Future. I would even throw The Weeknd in there. Like all these artists initially emerged during this blog era. And I was really tapped into that world and I had a lot of good relationships with the blogs. And I, at you know, one point I was a blogger myself. So I was somebody that people would like hire to get their music posted just cause I would just send out email blasts and I had good relationships. And oftentimes if I emailed 30 blogs, four or five would, would post it because at that point they grew to trust me. Like, oh, okay, this kid has good taste and is always sending us good music. So a lot of people were trying to hire me for like digital marketing jobs during that three year stretch of me temping. But at that point I, I was like, you know what? I really want to do A&R. I'm not going to settle for anything less than that. I'll stay as a temp and learn the system 
and like figure it out until I can get an a and job. So I was applying for a and jobs and turning down digital jobs and marketing jobs. Um, still hustling and doing my digital stuff on the side, for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't get a real actual job in the a and department until 2010 when Sean Holiday, Tubby, hired me as his assistant. I was 27 and I was still rapping, but sort of like starting to figure out like, hmm, maybe this executive thing, maybe I could really go crazy as an a and if I really put my mind to it. So yeah, that, that kind of became my focus. And I think around that time, you had moved into marketing too, 2010. Yeah, well, so how, what was your transition from a and into the marketing space? Because I don't even remember that. I just know that one day you, you were a marketing person. So <laughs> they made some department changes at Geffen and my role was eliminated. I left for about three weeks and the guy that gave me my internship in marketing, Chris Clancy, who went on to wow. manage our future and and manage McBiller and I leave a and r he's going to start our future and about to make his transition. So Andrew Flad, who worked under him, was moving up. Right. So Justin Dreyfus was moving up. Yep. And it was like, hey, we have an opening over here. We want you back. But since I had only been gone for less than two months, I was still in the system. So I was able to maintain this dual a and r and marketing role. Got it. Yeah. So that's why that part projects that I a and R'd when I was still there, Yellow Wolf, working with Rock City loosely. Then I was able to still work on those things as a marketing person and a coordinator right. as I right. came up. That makes sense. Yeah. Then there's Top Dog. Yes. I was going to say 2010 is also the year that. The that, year of the dog. <laughs> it was the year that, you know, K Dot kind of transitioned into being Kendrick Lamar and started to really heat up in LA. And then there was also like just the whole LA rap scene at the time, which was very much connected to that blog scene that I was just talking about. And Nike talk, don't leave out Nike and talk. And Nike talk and the, blo- the, the, uh, the message boards, which I was heavy on the message boards too. I wasn't really on Nike talk like that, but I was on a, on a couple other ones heavy. And uh, yeah, I mean that whole era of LA rap um, from Pac Div to Dom to you and I, you know, Blue and Exile. Early YG. <laughs> Early YG, Teron and Aomari. J305. J305, Diz Gabron. Uh, there was just a lot of really, really special, dope local rap, and it was getting a lot of attention on the blogs. And I had actually met the TDE guys when I worked at Warner in 2006 because Naeem Ali, who works with us at Def Jam, signed J-Rock in 06. Kendrick was KDOT. And it was Punch, Dave, Top. At the time, I think Top was going by Dude Dog, but I don't know if I I should say that on the podcast. You might want to edit that out. (laughs) But yeah, uh, yeah. So I met those guys really early in '06, and when I, you know, the stuff I talked about, like the blog stuff I was doing, I was helping those guys with uh, all their music releases, and um, you know, K Dot was always really, really special, really, really dope rapper. I remember when I was at Warner. Ironically, he got a development deal with Def Jam, and everybody was like, yo, K-Dot. Through Jay-Z, through Jay-Z, right? Yeah, Jay-Z gave him a development deal, and everybody was like, yo, K-Dot's about to go. Fast forward from 2006 to 2010, Overly Dedicated comes out. A lot of really special projects came out that year. Um, I didn't mention Overdose, too. My bad. I got to shout out Overdose, too. They were making great music. Shout out to Overdose. Yeah, shout out to all those guys. But yeah, um... 2010, man, that, that was a pivotal year for me because I got my, my real job. <laughs> you know, I got benefits. I could go to the doctor now. I can go to the dentist. It's incredible. <laughs> for the listeners that may want to explore the music business, in that defining period for you when you got your first job and you were watching how Interscope is developing these artists, what were the, I would say, more so values that you kind of would pass on to somebody else that you kind of held on to as like that guiding light to be able to maintain yourself through this, you know, weird business at times. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I would say resilience and persistence because the bigger things that happen later when you find success are all built upon the unspoken about hard work moments at the beginning. And it's like, you actually have to keep pushing in the face of closed doors. You know, I got fired from Warner 
you know, similar to the story where you got let go from Interscope and came back two months later, the same thing ended up happening to me in 2011, I think. So I definitely, you know, lost my job a couple times, slept on couches, got the call from mom, like, you sure you don't want to go to grad school? And I just continued, you know, I woke up every day and I was like, I'm going to figure this out. So it sounds very cliche, but it's it's actually a true thing that you can manifest things and you can kind of point your life in the direction that you want it to end up and just put in the work daily. And, you know, specifically for the music business, relationships are everything and your reputation is everything. So doing good work with good people will yield good things. And, you know, it's a creative industry, so you actually have to be a part of creating things that matter to people and that, that matter culturally. And that becomes your calling card to get you into the next door. It's like, oh, I worked on, I was a part of this thing that mattered. So now I, I have this opportunity to work on something else that might matter. And then you look back, <laughs> you know, 15, 20 years later, and you're like, oh shit, we were there. We saw Good Kid Mad City debut. We were there, literally. What was it like for you? Like, what's your perspective on that? And how, how, how would you explain your process in, in, in dealing with all that? You know, I, I, I credit a lot of that to my, my tribe and my village and my parents and my grandparents and the values that were instilled in me early and my faith in knowing that the things that were meant for me, I would have and the ones that are not, I'm okay with because I'm okay with who I am and I'm okay with the place that I'm in and truly with what's meant for me. I think so often, like, we get caught up in, like, looking at people's steps and trying to follow their path so closely that we sometimes get lost in the fact that, like, well, there's something a little bit different about me that actually may be my gift and I may be able to navigate it a little different. And I think I've always just tried to be a part of the things I haven't seen before. I think it's changed now as I've had a child and gotten married and, you know, the younger me would have said a different thing. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living for, of, of everything I've ever created in my life, I never made anything that could love me back. Real. Until my son. So to me, this is a gift to be able to make these things and create with people that I care about on a daily. And, but I, I do it for him. That's real. So let's fast forward. So like, is the 2023 version of Tunji, like looking back at that 2010, like first getting the job, first getting the shot, were there ever aspirations to be running a record label at that time? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I just wanted to be Jay-Z. So I wanted to be the best rapper and like the greatest executive at the same time. So <laughs> that was the whole goal. Wow. So to be at Def Jam is interesting. Yeah, that was, and obviously like, it's interesting because I grew up, you know, I grew up on the West Coast, but I went to high school on the East Coast. So right. being in high school from 96 to 2000 and, and the albums that came out on Def Jam during that era, the DMX, the Jay-Zs, yep. the Foxy Brown, the, the Case, the Nutty, Nutty Professor, all that stuff. Being on the East Coast for that time, I, I grew to really, really appreciate the Def Jam brand and like what it stood for. You know, the Def Jam execs were the first execs that I even knew existed, that I was like, oh, I know who they are, you know, right. because there was so much culture around what they were doing at the time. Hmm. But having grown up in California, I was also like the biggest Dre and Snoop and Pac fan. So Interscope and Def Jam were always, for me, my favorite labels and like the labels that I really felt like were iconic brands. And I felt like I understood what they, what they meant. You know, I understood what an Interscope artist was and I understood what a Def Jam artist was. I was also like, you know, a massive underground backpack fan. So it's like, you know, on my mood board of labels, I would also put like Stone's Throw and XL and right. some of those other kind of indie labels, like Warp, you know, <laughs> things like that. And labels that are a little bit more scrappy and, and build 
in a different way than the majors do. But I, I was the kid that was like going to the underground shows and working at the label, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And like making underground raps, but like marketing big mainstream radio rap. Right. So I was always kind of like living this dual citizenship of like, I'm the one that can pull these worlds together. I want to pull kids that are like from the underground and figure out ways to make them get into the mainstream tastefully. Or, or I want to like find something that's a little bit more rough around the edges and add a taste level to it and, and make it make sense. So, cause I was always kind of living between those worlds, you know? Do you feel like that's kind of what has attracted you to some of what, what some would consider the left of center, but more so now has been deemed mainstream? Yeah, I mean, the, the funny thing is the left to center stuff always and eventually becomes the mainstream if, right. it's, if it's given the right opportunity to grow and, and you know, really scale up. But uh, yeah, I would say the, the, the blueprint was being at Interscope and watching these artists that didn't really make much sense become global stars and also seeing, like literally seeing Kendrick from day one and watching it grow without losing the magic. And I was like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? And also growing up in the Bay and like hearing a lot of different types of music growing up. My parents are from Nigeria. I grew up with them playing a lot of Nigerian music and African music mixed with R&B and soul music. And then when I would go to school, it was all rap and like Tupac and, and Snoop. So I had, a, I had a really great foundation of great music to build on, not only as an artist, but eventually as an exec. All of that stuff added up to like, okay, when I actually have an opportunity to like sign something, yeah, it's got to be something that lives up to all this stuff that I love. I want to like really bet on special, special black artists and make it make sense to the rest of the world, you know? Let's talk about the, the Wakanda Forever process. Where should we start? We can't talk about Wakanda Forever without talking about the first Black Panther album from 2018, right? Correct. Which you worked on because you were working so closely with Kendrick, doing all the marketing for Kendrick's projects. And then at that point, I had actually left Interscope and mm -hmm. I was at RCA. You were still at Interscope. We were still talking. Obviously, we were still close. And the first soundtrack was just so special and you know, I think a really amazing moment, not only for Kendrick, but all of the artists that ended up being on the soundtrack. And it was a really great mix of the kind of new era of Afrobeats was, was peppered onto the project, but it was also a lot of young stars from America. And I remember working on a little bit with Dave, like Dave would call me. I didn't even know what the hell he was working on, but he was just like, yo, I need to like- Dave Free, right? Dave Free, yes. Sorry, Dave Free from PG Lang now. But yeah, he, uh, he was calling me and he's like, yo, I need like a bunch of dope, singers from Africa. And I'm like, okay. And I just sent him an email with a bunch of stuff. Yo, I need a bunch of rappers. I'm like, okay. So I sent him, you know, some Nigerian rappers, some South African rappers. And then a few months later, you know, I found out, oh man, man, there's like this Black Panther movie is coming out and there's going to be a soundtrack. That project and that film were just so impactful. And, you know, I think really just important culturally. And, and you know, as someone who ended up signing a lot of Afrobeats artists years after that, that album was really, really impactful in the sense of like, just being a part of a cultural moment that made people around the world appreciate African culture hmm. in a deeper way. I would say, especially from what it felt like to me, black Americans, I think, were able to kind of like take a moment and breathe in the culture. And then, you know, as things happened, you ended up at RCA. Yep. And you did Judas and the Black Messiah. We did Judas and the Black Messiah. Yeah, I did a little bit, but you—that was you, bro. You and Dash, <laughs> you guys killed that. Um, we won, an Oscar won the for Oscar her. Yeah. for her. I mean, I, I played a small role. I helped a little bit. <laughs> Nipsey Jay Z song. Nipsey Jay Z record, and then we both came to Def Jam, and 2022. It's time for another film, and. It just kind of made sense. I remember I met Ryan Coogler at your wedding. We had a great conversation about both being from the Bay and being young creatives and, you know, yeah, we got to figure out something to work on one day. And then fast forward, Wakanda Forever is coming out. We just kind of just got to work. I don't even remember how it started. I feel like you, you were like, yo, th this is happening. And I was like, oh, okay. And then one day it was like, oh yeah, we're doing this. Well, I think it was the Nigeria conversation. It was like, look, 
Brian and Ludwig are going over to Nigeria. Yep. <laughs> and I need someone that we trust, that we feel very confident in, and that we know can handle the nuances of all of this work. Yep. And you said? I said Shaney. And the funny thing is, I was like, I wish I could do it. <laughs> 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 you know, I was like, man, I want to get on a plane and go work on some records in Nigeria right now. But it was three months or three or four months into year one of Def Jam. So I was like, well, I can't go. And luckily, you know, in the years since the first film and in the years since Interscope, I had really immersed myself in the Afrobeat scene. I signed David O, I signed WizKid, I signed Thames. Yep. All of that stuff was at RCA before we came to Def Jam. But in working with those artists, I had built up a great network of people and had built a lot of great relationships, especially in Nigeria. And when I was in Nigeria in 2019, I had connected with Shaney. Shaney Saraki. Shaney Saraki through Anthony Saleh, who ironically now manages Kendrick. Then it turned out that I'd actually met Shaney 12 years earlier because my family is friends with his family. And at one point, him and his grandmother and his whole family had come to LA in like 2008. And my mom flew down from the Bay to visit this family and took me and, and my then girlfriend, now wife, to go visit this family. And I was like, I don't even know who, I'm like, mom, who are these people? Wow. <laughs> and I was like, mom, who are these people that you're making me go visit? I don't even know them. And then, you know, years later, I, I meet Shaney and I'm like, you were that kid from that house. <laughs> Randomly, wow. I didn't even know who the hell you were. <laughs> but we ended up becoming really good friends after we met in 2019. And I was really impressed by him because, number one, he had great relationships with every artist. And number two, he created the Native Magazine. The Nigerian CNN. The Nigerian CNN. I mean, yeah, I, basically the premier publication that covers African culture, music, fashion, the getting into sports. I would compare it to like what the fader was mm. at its peak. That's what the native means to the Afrobeat scene. And, and you know, Shani and his partners and his team built that. So we became really good friends. And, um, you know, when you called me and you were like, yo, we need someone on the ground who knows everybody and can connect the dots and is organized and can actually like work as a creative partner with Ludwig and Ryan, I was like, Shaney. And, you know, I, I hit him and he, <laughs> I, I don't think he actually believed me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he actually like thought it was a real thing until he started talking to Ludwig and he was like, yo, they bought their flights. They're coming. They're going to be here in a week. I'm like, yeah, man, let's, like, let's do, <laughs> get the studio ready. Like start putting the schedule together. And, you know, I remember texting him, I'm telling you, I, and telling him, hey, man, if you just really focus on this and deliver, this is something that could change your career and change your life. And, you know, none of us really knew what was going to happen, but he was able to get not only the traditional musicians from all over Nigeria who are experts and play, you know, all of the traditional local Nigerian instruments and know all of the traditional Nigerian ways of singing, but he was able to get all of the young stars and contemporary artists that are like blowing up the Afrobeat scene. So he was able to get Burna, and Thames and Remma and Fireboy and CK and, you know, and also- DB and Gogo. DB and Gogo from South Africa and Busiswa and, you know, also introducing new artists like Bloody Civilian. And, you know, he, he really like had a bunch of sleepless nights and delivered. I also have to shout out uh, Lady Donnelly, mm -hmm. who's another amazing artist who kind of showed her A&R skills and pulling together a lot of uh, the great talent that ended up on the soundtrack and in the film. So, yeah, I mean, it's funny how us meeting it in 2008 <laughs> as assistants, just hustling, trying to keep a job, ends up 14, 15 years later with having the opportunity to help people change their, change their lives and really give people opportunities to grow their own careers. And, you know, people are nominated for Oscars and <laughs> we're going to award shows and doing cool panels and just celebrating the culture that we're building together, which, which is really the best part of, of doing this work. And, and just to add to that, I, I don't think, I don't think we could do this work if it felt transactional. Fact. I truly think there's a sense of obligation to one another and a kinship and a bond to make sure that we're showing up in ways that we know are our gifts uniquely to kind of add to the greater good of whatever the task at hand may be, whether that's running Def Jam or creating Wakanda Forever, or 
to your point, all of these things in our lives kind of lined us up. Yeah, there's another there's this. another connection too. Like I met Ludwig in 2011 or 2012 because I was trying to sign Childish Gambino and he was Gambino's producer and still is. And they were working on, I think the Camp album. I remember he had his own, he had a solo project that he was working on and he was just a super talented, really energetic guy. And we remained friends. And then eventually I was actually able to sign Gambino <laughs> when we got to RCA. So we worked, you know, on that stuff as well. So a lot of connections that started way, way before any of the, the uh, Wakanda Forever stuff happened kind of just coalesced at the right moment, whether that was Ludwig, Ryan, Shaney, like people that I met in totally different spaces across a totally, like a, across basically a decade, <laughs> you know? And obviously our relationship, which goes back hella, hella, hella far, so. Okay, so, you know, most people would ask, like, if you're stranded on an island, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, if you're in a spaceship, right, and you have to put five albums into orbit for another species to discover, to understand what our human experience is, what are those five albums? Wow. Um, the first album would be What's Going On by Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. The second album would be Off the Wall by Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. Third album would be The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill. Fourth album, let's go with the White Album, The Beatles. Mm. Yeah. It's hard to pick a favorite Beatles album, but that one, that, that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good example. And then fifth album, I might go with a Sade. I might go with like a, like a Love Deluxe. I don't know. How do you pick a favorite Sade album? Like, Diamond Life, Love Sade Deluxe. Yeah, just, just like a, the, yeah. the best of Sade. <laughs> the Sade fine. compilation or like the Sade, this is Sade playlist. <laughs> yeah, that works. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like that's a pretty good cross section. I, I didn't, I didn't name any rap though. The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill? Oh yeah, there's a lot of rap on there. Okay, we'll, we'll take that. All right, so, so no, nah, the same, same question for you though. What are your five essential space albums? <laughs> Mm, ambitions of a Rider, Tupac, Michael Jackson, Thriller, Kendrick Lamar to Pimp a Butterfly, Classic. Phil Collins, I Don't Care Anymore. We love Uncle Phil. <laughs> and um, Hey Ya <laughs> by Andre. Yeah. You can't miss with, a, with, a, with an Outkast pick. Like, Out, Outkast is never wrong. Yeah. You can never go wrong with Outkast. Seriously. I want to take six and add Lift Me Up by Rihanna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shout out to Thames on that pen. Oh my God. Yeah, the greatest. So with everybody that we bring on to the In Proximity podcast, we do a Prox Rex segment. And I want to ask you, are there any book recommendations, artists that we should be watching, a quote, anything that you would want to leave us with to kind of also dig a little bit deeper into? Artists that you should be watching, I, I can name 50 of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I Actually, I I like that for you. Let's Let's yeah. talk about some artists that we should be watching in that. You feel yeah. it on the cusp, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first one I'll mention is someone whose uh, music is on the soundtrack and who's featured in the Voices Rising documentary piece that's on Disney Plus now. Her name is Bloody Civilian. She's a singer, songwriter, producer from Abuja, Nigeria. I would describe her music as urgent <laughs> and powerful. The best description I think that I've made to compare it to anything that you might have heard before is maybe like if, if MIA was from Nigeria, I would say. Wow. Yeah, um, that's accurate. There's another artist from Nigeria who's a veteran who's been around for a while. His name is Ade Kunle Gold. A lot of people call him AG. I'm excited about him. He's making an incredible album that comes out this summer that I think is going to go crazy. There's a kid from the UK named Elmine, E L M I E N E. 
really, really special vocalist of Sudanese descent. He is from Oxford, UK. I'm excited about everything that he's working on. He's really, really dope. I could go on for a really long time. <laughs> Two more. Two more. Okay. A singer from Atlanta named Chase Shakur, who has a really, really dope tone and a dope pen. He's making some really, really cold R&B. One more. I'll say Coco Jones. Shout out to Coco. Coco Jones. She's having a banner year. Triple threat, singer, songwriter, actress, performer, dancer, whatever you need her to do. I think she's going to be one of the biggest music stars in the, in the near future. So I'm excited about those five. I could name 10 times as many as that, but that's a good place to start. Okay, so what about you? My Rex. Yeah. Book, um, song. Yeah. Give us a quote, something. Malcolm X quote. Education is our passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Bars. I'll also add a book recommendation, which is, what the heck is EOS? And EOS is based on employee operating system and just kind of how we start to manage the time in the day and how we communicate to our team and maintaining the human element of it. Another book is The Immutable Laws of Branding. Right. Incredible book. I probably refer to that weekly. Right. And I'm sorry you all can't have it, but I will also recommend my grandmother's Peach Cobbler, which is so <laughs> fire. Tunji, I want to thank you for joining us today. This has been a pleasure. I really hope that, you know, for our listeners, they're able to take something away with this. Um, and man, just wishing you the most success in all of your endeavors in the future, bro. Likewise, man. Thank you. You're involved in all my endeavors, so that, that includes <laughs> that includes your success. Uh, but yeah, no, this is a pleasure. This is amazing. I'm just, you know, super glad to even be a part of this. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> In Proximity is a production of Proximity Media. If you like the show, be sure to follow, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And tell your friends and loved ones to do the same. If you have someone in your life who you think would like the show, send them a link. Don't forget to follow at Proximity Media on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. The show is produced by me, Paula Mardo. Executive producers are Ryan Kugler, Zinzi Kugler, Sevo Hanyan, and me. Our theme song and additional music is composed by Ludwig Gorenson. Ken Nana is our sound designer and mix engineer. Paulina Cherizova is our production assistant. Audio editing for this episode is by Cedric Wilson. Special thanks to the whole Proximity Media team and to you for listening to In Proximity. Meet you back here next week. You just really showcased your bay. Yeah, I have to. Everywhere right I go, there. you have to. I wish I, I wish my accent. I wish I had a bay accent. Is that an accent? That's, I don't think. I don't think Californians have an accent. That's because you're Californian. <laughs> <laughs> you don't hear it. <laughs>